Merci beaucoup. Who's ready to axe the tax? Who's ready to build the homes? Who's ready to fix the budget? Who's ready to stop the crime? Yeah. J'allais commencer mon discours euh, en parlant de mon plan de gros bon sens, de couper taxes, impôts, bâtir des logements, réparer le budget euh, et stopper les crimes. I was going to start my speech today as properly scripted by my team, talking about my common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. But I was interrupted by the testimony I just read from our very own Prime Minister just yesterday. He said something incredible, although not so surprising. Of course, what we're investigating is whether a foreign dictatorship interfered in our democracy in multiple elections to help him win. A communist dictatorship seeking to keep in office someone who said he admires that communist dictatorship. But his defense actually speaks for itself. The Prime Minister was asked why he didn't do anything about this interference, even though he was warned in briefing notes, is that he doesn't read briefing notes. Now, we often don't believe the things that this guy says, but I think that most Canadians would believe that defense. I think it's plausible that Justin Trudeau doesn't read documents that come before him. Um, in fact, I think it's likely that he doesn't read things that come before him. And I think that that defense is interesting for three reasons. One, because the ivory tower elites who support him and his ideology of concentrating all the power in their and money in their hands, uh, they seem, they always tell us how wonderfully sophisticated and cosmopolitan they are, and how brilliant they are, and that's why they're entitled. They're experts, after all, right? Uh, th that's why they're entitled to decide for other people. Uh, but yet they're prepared to support a guy who says he doesn't read. It's like, he might be a know-nothing, but he's our know-nothing, right? <laughs> they support a guy who confuses decimals with decibels, who says budgets balance themselves, even when they never do, who says he doesn't think much about monetary policy, admits he's not very good with numbers advises Canadians to pay for their tuition and their home renovations on their credit card. And this is the bright light, the genius, that they believe should be able to run the lives of, of mechanics who are able to take apart an engine and put it back together with blindfolds on. That, that, that the single mom who can budget her, balance her budget on a minimum wage salary needs advice on budgeting from the guy who can't budget uh, for himself. Th that is the ultimate ultimate irony of the elitism is that these so pseudo-intellectuals vest all their faith in this guy of all people. The second thing that's so interesting, and this came up, by the way, in his defense on another scan, when he had accepted a quarter million dollar free vacation from someone who had met with him asking for, and later received, a $15 million grant from his government. The kind of cronyism that would get a small town mayor put in jail. But the defense the Prime Minister gave at the time was is that in the meeting, he didn't actually, it, it wasn't he, he wasn't substantially important because he actually doesn't run the government. He's a ceremonial figurehead. And therefore, he didn't have any actual power over the government he heads to give the individual what he was asking for in exchange for that famous free vacation. Even though, in the Prime Minister's own Open and Accountability Guide, the machinery of government, and that's a quote, is the exclusive responsibility of the Prime Minister. Which brings me to the second reason why his, I don't don't read my briefing notes defense is so interesting. And it is this. He wants all the power and none of the responsibility. He literally wants to control the entire economy. He wants to nationalize large industries with monstrous taxpayer-funded subsidies. And yet he, he, he wants to print $600 billion without having any responsibility for the resulting inflation. He wants to increase the cost of government without taking any of the blame for the resulting inflation interest payments that households must pay on their own debt after he drove up the rates. He wants none of the responsibility for the fact that we have the slowest economic growth in the OECD over the next five years and over the next 35 years after he promised all this spending was going to stimulate the contrary. He wants to have total control over what you can see and say online to protect us all from these dangerous forces that might influence our thinking if we are not protected by the angels in the government. And yet, when there is actually a risk of manipulation by hostile and
malicious actors like, say, a communist regime in Beijing, he can't even take the responsibility of reading his briefing notes. This is the irony, the great irony of his leadership, and one of the reasons why I think he's succeeded in doubling housing costs, giving us the worst inflation in 40 years, sending 2 million people to the food banks, 8,000 people signing up for a Facebook group called the Dumpster Diving Network because they now have to eat out of a garbage can after he drove food prices rising with his carbon tax. He wants to control every aspect of your life, and then when he ruins your life, he wants to take none of the responsibility for the ruin that he caused. And... The third reason why this testimony and this entire scandal is so consequential and indicative is why the hell did a dictatorship, a communist dictatorship, on the other side of the world consider it such a, a strategic imperative to keep this guy as prime minister? What was their motive? Why did they believe that they, as a cover for what is a radical departure from the Canadian way, a radical departure that sees in every way that the people are to be made small so that the government can be made big. He dis and we see the, the consequences of this. You see, even if he were competent, it is not possible for any one person to run 40 million other people. It is simply not possible. Humans are far too complicated. Their interactions far too numerous for one central authority, no matter how wise and virtuous it claims to be, to make all the decisions for them. It has to leave them to make as many decisions as possible for themselves. Worse yet, when you have the only thing worse than having some all-knowing elite try to control everybody's life is to have someone doing that when he doesn't even read his briefing notes, right? <laughs> because not only will he overrule the common sense of the common people, but he will do it badly, as he has done, and hence the consequences that we see uh, with today. 76% of Canadians telling pollsters, who 76% of folks who don't yet own a home, believe they never will. This would have been unimaginable eight years ago. Unimaginable. It would have been unimaginable eight years ago, before Justin Trudeau, to think that not only would he pass a law to control what you can see and say on the internet, but the, the, he would then pat, put forward another law which could put you under house arrest or a peace bond under suspicion of something unacceptable you might say in the future. You know, this guy, if he read, if he had read 1984, he would have thought it was an instruction manual <laughs> and not a warning. <laughs> Fortunately, there is an outbreak of common sense across the country. Yes, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, General Hillier said that he, the thing he hears the most often when he walks around the streets of this country is, this is not Canada. We don't recognize this place. And that's what I hear from fifth, everything from fifth generation Canadians to uh, immigrants who arrived here 10 years ago. They say, my God, what happened to this country in the last eight years? Do you imagine if you had been in a coma in 2015 and woke up to this nightmare, uh, how unfamiliar it would all seem. But the good news, my friends, is that life was not like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. Our common sense plan may seem simple because it is all the greatest things in life are simple. Comple complexity is the last refuge of the scoundrel. So let's get down to the simple plan that will work, the simple principles that have always worked. We will ax the tax to bring down the cost of heat, gas, and groceries, and we will cut income taxes so that hard work actually pays off again and people can bring home the benefits of their hard work. And we will say, here and everywhere that we will ax the t who in this room is ready to ax the tax ax the tax ax the tax ax the tax fantastic we have whenever i, I announce my plan to ax the tax there's such an outburst of enthusiasm <laughs> that uh just uncontrollable um it's a frenzy, really. Um, and then further compound that with lower income taxes to reward hard work. Some people find these ideas so revolutionary <laughs> after eight years of being broke that they can't contain their enthusiasm. Um, but uh, that's a good thing. We need to have some enthusiasm. I think the conservative movement is very enthusiastic these days. Wouldn't you agree? That the, the deter, our determination to cut taxes is not just about having you know a price discount that could be advertised in a dollar store flyer. It's not just about saving pennies here and there. It's about a fundamental philosophical disagreement. We believe that a dollar in the hands of the person who earned it is always more powerful than in the hands of the politician who taxed it.
This is a philosophical disagreement that I believe that the welder who can fuse together metals with, with his bare hands is more, has more brain power in how to direct his dollar than the guy who doesn't read his briefing notes, right? And so that is the fundamental philosophical difference when we talk about cutting taxes. And it, it goes further to energy. There's a fundamental philosophical difference there as well. I believe that we should fight to protect our environment and combat climate change with technology and not taxes. I believe in lowering the cost of alternatives rather than raising the cost of traditional energy we still need. I believe in greenlighting green projects. Trudeau believes in putting stop signs in front of our workers. And here's the key. I believe in bringing home powerful paychecks for our people rather than what he believes, which is to drive away production into the hands of the dirty dictators. I believe in bringing it home, in other words. So if you doubt that this is the disagreement, look at every form of energy and transportation Trudeau's fanatical environment minister has opposed. He's obviously against Canadian oil and gas, while he strongly supports coal burning in China and oil production in the Middle East. Uh, he's like Mark Carney that way. Carney's against pipelines in Western Canada at the same time as he sits uh, in the executive towers of a company that bought pipelines in Brazil and the Middle East, right? They're, they're strongly in favor of foreign petroleum interests, but strongly against our workers right here in Canada. Uh, that, that is the view of Justin Trudeau and his successor, his incoming uh, successor, Carbon Tax Carney. They agree on that much. And But furthermore, th but his fanatical environment minister has been in the past against nuclear. He's against nuclear. So we, we, take, we, we shut down nuclear, then half the lights in this room go out right now. There's more than half of the electricity in this province of Ontario actually comes from nuclear. Common sense conservatives understand that the best way to add zero emitting baseload electricity across our country is by expanding and safely approving can-do reactors and small modular reactors. We're going to unleash the power of our atoms for, free, for clean and low-cost energy for our people. And then you've got the minerals of electric by these brilliant experts who are quoted endlessly in the media. By the way, don't you think when the media quotes an expert, it should be a journalistic practice to one, note whether that so-called expert has a financial interest in the poli policy they're advancing, and two, how many times they've been wrong in the past, right? Uh, if you're wrong all the time, you're not much of an expert. Well, they were definitely wrong on crime because under the previous conservative government, we brought in uh, tougher sentences for the worst violent offenders. And what happened? Violent crime went down 25%. And you know what else went down? Incarcerations. We had fewer people in jail after all the experts told us we'd have to build new ones. Why? Because the people we locked up were coming in and out anyway. They were like, it was like the whole Hotel California for them. They were checking out but never leaving. They were going back. We had to reserve a bed for them no matter what. So we thought it'd be better if we just left them there so that they couldn't punctuate their sentences by bat baseball batting someone over the head in the streets. We kept them in jail and the, the softer criminals, well, we scared the hell out of them so they went away. Now if this seems like simplistic thinking, look at the stats, it actually worked. So you can you can turn to the professors, uh, the liberal professors who say otherwise, but it actually brought crime down and since Trudeau brought in C83, that meant house arrest for career car thieves. They can sit in their living room and watch Netflix during their sentence or play Grand Theft Auto. Um, <laughs> and then go back out and steal another car, right? Car thefts are up 200%. There's new, there's 40, there's a car stolen every 40 minutes in Brampton. Since he brought in C75, the automatic bail law, violent crime is up over 32%. That was as of 2022. Wait till the 23 numbers come out. And since he banned hunting rifles and went after lawful sports shooters and at the same time removed criminal uh, mandatory minimums for gun criminals, the number of shootings in Canada has gone up by a hundred percent. So we're going to reverse all that. We're going to bring in jail, not bail. No more house arrests for car thieves. We're going to let our licensed, law-abiding, trained and tested sports shooters and hunters keep their property while throwing the gun criminals in jail and securing our ports and our borders. Common sense.
Common sense. Common sense means giving people back control of their lives. It means allowing them to make their own decisions with their own money. It means allowing them to express their own opinions and their own values and teach their kids their values on all matters, including on sexuality and gender. That kind of freedom is what Canadians have always come to expect. It is what has always worked. And so we will repeal the censorship laws, C-11. We will require university campuses, implement a respect for Section 2B, Charter Rights of Free Expression, as a condition of getting federal funding. If you want to... If you want, if you don't like Jordan Peterson, fine. Try debating him for once, because you can't shut him down. You can't shut down people you disagree with. You have to have open and honest debate, which has always been the Canadian way. We will ban the terrorist group, the IRGC. We will stand up for our Jewish friends and neighbors who have been mercilessly targeted with anti-Semitism. And we will cut back on foreign aid to dictators, terrorists, and multinational bureaucracies, and we will put that money right back into rebuilding our military so that our soldiers, our sailors, and airmen can stand on guard for all of us. We're going to defund all the terrorist groups and all the international dictators. We're going to bring our money home for our people and, and stand up for our people and stand up against the dictators in Venezuela. They're going to be selling less oil because we're going to be selling good ethical Canadian products onto the world market. Libertad. Some people here from Venezuela, some people here from every part of the world, from originally from Iran, the wonderful Persian community. Where else? Brazil, Israel, God bless Israel. Where, what else? Cuba, Colombia, wow. Saskatoon, most important of all, Saskatoon. The greatest place on earth. But no matter where you're from, wouldn't you all agree that it feels like we're all a long way from home? We're all, we're all a long way from home. We're all a long way from the country that we knew and still love. But I'm here today to paint the picture of hope and home. It's the picture of parents who wake up in the morning and provide their kids with a good healthy breakfast that they know they can afford before sending them safely, skipping down the street to school. No fear that their kids will be abducted or harmed and that when they get to school, they'll learn about reading, writing, arithmetic, and history. It's the picture of those parents getting into their cars and going off to work. Maybe the wife works in the energy sector, maximizing great Canadian energy while bringing home a powerful paycheck. Maybe her husband swings a hammer, banging nails to build beautiful and affordable homes for some other family to live in. And maybe as they drive to pick up their kids, they pass a cenotaph to see local legionnaires sweeping away debris and planting fresh flowers in honor of our heroes. And when they bring their kids home and finish squabbling with them to get them to bed, and they sit down at the kitchen table, secure that they can afford their home and their life, that they're safe in their community, their eyes meet in a way that can only say, we made it, the promise was kept. Because after it all, after all the hard work, we are home. These are our people. These are our people. That is our country. This is our home. Your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home. Thank you very much. God bless Canada. Thank you.